Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. We're glad if you're joining with us this evening, we'll seek God's face, we'll ask his blessing in Jesus' name. Our Father, our God in heaven, we thank you for the blessings, the loving kindness shown to us in another day, all of which is utterly undeserved. We forwent that in our uh, fathers in the Garden of Eden, but Lord, we forgo it in terms of our own behavior, what we are day by day by day. But we thank you that you are gracious. We thank you for sending your Son. And we pray that as we gather now in his name, that you would bless us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We've been um, trying to um, look at something of the history of God's people, Israel. It's not, well, it's not meant to be overly detailed. There are details. Um, we're going to think this evening about a, a man called Rehoboam and the man who goes with him, Jeroboam. And so we're reading in 1 Kings chapter 12. This is an important piece of Israel's history, God's word. And Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel, had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was still in Egypt, for he has fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly, and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What shall we have? Uh, what share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue, but all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariot to haste to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, 
You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. Now the chapter continues and it tells us then about Jeroboam and how he um, stirs the people to idolatry. But we'll leave it there for now. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father, our God in heaven, we are glad to turn into your most holy presence. We recognize that in and of ourselves, there is no way that we could enter before you. We are sinners. We are those who, though we've been forgiven, time and again fall back into sin. We are those who know the commandments, but time and again, O oh God, we, we flout them, we break them, we grieve your heart by the way that we are. Forgive and cleanse us our sins, we pray. And cause, O oh God, that we might better learn your way and that we might know your grace again this evening, reaching out to us. We thank you that as we thought of the children of Israel, we've been reminded on a number of occasions now that you were so forbearing, so gracious, so patient, so full of uh, long suffering in all your dealings with them. And we thank you and we praise you uh, for your loving kindness and the assurance that you remain full of loving kindness. Help us, Lord, we pray, not to, to press that in, in a wrong way, not to think that because you're loving kind, it, uh, full of loving kindness, it doesn't matter, but grant us, O oh God, to receive that loving kindness with uh, a sense of the, 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 the fear of God, and a sense, O oh God, of what it means to be pardoned anew and afresh, to be able to pray that prayer day by day. Um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We thank you, Father, that you are willing day by day to forgive and cleanse us from sin. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help us that we may not take that as some sort of system, um, something to be taken for granted, but that we may sense our sin anew and afresh, that we may confess our sin and that we may turn back to you day by day by day, knowing that we need your forgiveness. We pray your blessing upon us this evening as we open your word together, and we pray, Lord, that as we grapple with something of the history of the children of Israel, that you'd help us, Lord, to take it on board, and, and then reading the Bible, that it would be helpful to us in understanding where these passages are going. Lord, we want to be filled with your word. How shall a young man keep his way pure? Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And, and Lord, we know that, that all too easily we can carry a big Bible. We can um, speak in big terms of believing the Bible. But to, to, to listen to the Bible and to obey the Bible and to fall in with your holy word. We pray, Lord, that you would give us that desire to, to, to live in the fear of God, to live, um, oh God, with, with a, a sense of this is God's word and our need to follow you. Bless us, we pray, as we gather those at home, cause your face to shine upon them. Little ones have dealings with their hearts. Help us in the midst of another busy week and grant us your grace whether we're, we're at home, at school, at university, whether, oh God, that we're, we're, we're out in the workplace and, and work is busy and demanding. Lord, we pray, give us your grace and help us that we may live for you, for your glory, for your praise, and for your honour. It's our prayer to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we um, have been trying to gather something of the history of the children of Israel. It's quite a big project. We're not looking at every detail, <laughs> even though at times you may think uh, that, that that could be the case. And I understand what you're, you're thinking, but we're not looking at every detail. But what we're trying to do is to home in on the key moments of Israel's history. So God raises um, Moses, they cross the Red Sea and so on. Um, 
the, the people stray and do all sorts of foolish things recorded for us largely in the book of Numbers. Uh, God raises up wonderfully Joshua and gives them another opportunity to, to learn. He gives them the book of Deuteronomy. He sets before them the river Jordan in full flight and there's the city of Jericho. And it's all that they might learn and demonstrate faith. And wonderfully that younger generation did. They remained faithful, but with the, the passing of Joshua, and Joshua knew it, and we looked at that at the end of Joshua. Joshua knew what would happen. But with the, the passing of Joshua, they go downhill. And though there's a, a very temporary, good beginning, it doesn't last. And God ends up sending them judges. And there's judge after judge after judge. They weren't perfect men, but they brought the people back. That culminates in uh, Samuel, the story of Hannah, but Samuel. And what a wonderful judge Samuel was. Now, we're not saying that he was perfect and remember his sons. But what a good man he was. But the people rejected him. They'd had enough of Samuel's quiet, um, God-centered, God-honoring ministry. They didn't want him anymore. And they wanted a king. They chose for themselves a king. What a disaster that was. Saul is um, set before them as the king. And the people love it to begin with. It fitted in with their worldly thinking. He was tall and handsome and so on. But what a disaster it was. It brought us to David. A man after God's own heart. Um, and what a wonderful thing that we see of David in the earlier part of his lifetime. But Bathsheba comes along. And he, he gets it all wrong with Bathsheba. And sad, sadly, that spells really the tale of the rest of his life. After David came Solomon. We looked at that last week. Solomon, the picture of grace. The picture of grace because um, how kind God was. He was Bathsheba's son. But God is going to raise this man. Solomon, the presentation of blessing. What blessing came to the children of Israel through this man. And uh, we didn't actually highlight it, but in 1 Kings in chapter 10, you've got the story there of the Queen of Sheba. What blessing. And then at the end, and that's going to relate to what we're talking about tonight with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, um, Solomon, the portrayal of failure. And sadly, this man, um, his, his heart is taken by the many foreign women in his life. And um, I'll, get, I'll get it right tonight, 700 wives, 300 concubines. They won his heart. They turned him from God. There was all sorts of idolatry. And God is angry and God says that the kingdom was going to be um, torn from him. And so we come to the story of Rehoboam, his son. He comes to power in chapter 11. And right at the end, then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. He's to be the king. He's going to reign in his place. Four headings tonight, four headings. The judgment that falls, because what we're reading about in chapter 12 is God's judgment. Make no mistake about that. The pride that rules. And uh, sad to say, that Rehoboam is going to uh, fail to, 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 to think carefully and Jeroboam is a man full of pride. The counsel that prevails. And, and there is counsel here, good counsel, but there's bad counsel and it prevails. The division that follows. And sadly, there's going to be a division uh, that we'll see here tonight that will spell out the history then of the children of Israel and you'll get the people of Israel and the people of Judah and they'll not come back um, in in the way that we find them in David and in Solomon's time those four headings first of all the judgment that falls when we think of the Bible we might want it uh, that every story and every happening tells us something that is simple and something that is happy we might, um, we might like it to be that way, that the Bible was ju just a happy book. And of course, the Bible wonderfully does tell of great happiness. And the book of Revelation culminates in the wonderful happiness of heaven. So, you know, we can be 
uh, quite content with that. But in the intervening, because of the fall into sin, there is much that spells unhappiness. And the episode that we're going to look at tonight is neither simple nor happy. But it is what happened. And it's a very, very, very important part of the story of the history of the people of Israel. What happens here will tell the story of Israel's history for years to come. Um, it's a very, very sad part of the story. And so a few weeks ago, we um, thought about the rejection of Samuel and his ministry, the clamor uh, for a king and someone who was going to sort of shout the orders and so on. They wanted a king. They wanted a king. Um, that was very, very important in terms of Israel's history. And now we see them with a succession of kings. And now here is a division. And this will further worsen the situation and make it all the more difficult. So these are two key incidents in the history of the children of Israel. What we have here this evening is the sad history that follows Solomon's death. And it covers a divide that takes place between Judah and the tribes of Israel between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And it's very important to recognize that this was a matter of judgment, God's judgment. Just as it was with Saul, that was a matter of God's judgment. It fell upon them because of their clamor for a king. And now here's judgment because of what had happened with Solomon. And even that, I suppose, thinking about it, um, follows on from what happened with David and Bathsheba. Uh, Saul would be the start of a line of human kings, and Jeroboam, um, in Rehoboam's time, would bring about a rift between the tribes of Israel that would never be healed. This was God's judgment. God's judgment. Now, if we go back to, to 1 Kings in chapter 11 for a moment, we know, of course, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. And tragically, um, he, he's tied into these uh, women and they take his heart. It's very, very sad that he flies in the face, such a, a wise man, given such wisdom, but he flies in the face of what God says. God had said, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. That's recorded in verse 2. Um, but Solomon clung to these in love. And very sadly, this is um, what happened. It, it was these women that turned his heart and so on and so forth. And we read of the judgment of God, verse 9. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. You see that emphasis? Remember we mentioned that last time, twice. Well, um, privilege brings responsibility, twice. And he and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father, David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So be very clear. This was the judgment of God. And um, it, it was that, that God stirred up trouble. Now, you may struggle with that, but it was because of what Solomon had done. Verse 14 of chapter 11. Now, the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king of Edom. And you can read that story. Didn't look at it there. Um, look at it there this evening. There's a second person uh, mentioned. Verse 23, Rezon, the king of Elida, who, was, um, who had fled from his lord and so on. And, and so there's the raising of these um, people who are causing trouble. And, and then we come to the story of this man, 
uh, Jeroboam. I can't tell the story in great detail there tonight, but it's in verse 26. Then Solomon's servant Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from uh, Zerida, whose mother's name was Ruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. So there's this tide of rebellion. It's mounting. It's, it's happening around um, Solomon. This tide of trouble. Um, and, and it's judgment. Make no mistake about that. God is stirring this situation. God is behind this. Now, that in itself is a very um, sober and serious issue, isn't it? You, you may want to think, you know, I've already said that you may want the, the Bible stories to be all happy and simple. Well, this one isn't so simple, but you, you may want to think, um, uh, sh you know, surely not in terms of judgment. Surely God judging his people, God bringing trouble on his uh, own people. Surely that could never happen. That could never be. But that's exactly how it was. And that's a very sober lesson for us tonight. It's a sober thing. It's, it's the lesson over and over again of the, of the kings. Progressively, God's anger would multiply. Now, we're not going to be able to look at all of the kings. We may, you know, look at one or two or something. But um, pr progressively, during the period of the kings, uh, God's anger is multiplying. It comes, first of all, on Israel, on the northern tribes. And then ultimately it will come on, on Judah, uh, along with Benjamin there. But it will come on, on Judah and you'll see the exile then of Judah in Daniel's day to Babylon. You might want to think that God would never do that to his people. And, and you know, worryingly, there seems to be that thought in modern day Christendom that um, we can do what we like in the church of God and God will bless whatever. That somehow God is for us and could never turn against us. But that's not true. That simply isn't true. And it's perfectly clear that God can turn against his people if his people turn against him. We always need to bear in mind that God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. Remember the context of that verse, it's Habakkuk, and Habakkuk is hearing that God is going to raise up um, their, their enemies against them. He's crying against God's people in terms of being a prophet, um, but the answer that comes is God is going to bring his enemies, and when he hears that, he can't even stand the thought that God could do such a thing, but that's exactly what he is going to do, and God can do that. And God does do that. Sometimes we bemoan, don't we, the situation of the church in the world at the moment. Well, we perhaps need to reflect upon where, 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 where do God's people stand in terms of faithfulness. Um, and we need to recognize that if God's people move away from God, God may well move against them. First Peter chapter 4 and we're told there aren't we that you know judgment is something that that begins not out there but it begins in here for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God and if it begins with us first what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God it's a serious issue we looked um, it's a few months ago, I don't know, maybe last year now, I lose track of these things, but Revelation chapter 2, we looked at the, the letter to the seven churches. Chapter 2, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your, fir you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The church at Ephesus, the lampstand was lost. The church was lost in Ephesus. It's a matter of history. Chapter 14 of verse 2, but I have a few things against you because you have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. It's, it's, it's there later in the chapter as well. 
um, at, at verse 21 and so on. These are very serious issues. It's possible for the church to bring the wrath of God down on herself. The judgment of God can be very, very slow. It would be very, very slow in dealing with Israel, but it did come. And we need to recognize that God is holy. This is a matter of God's judgment, the judgment that falls. But notice then the pride that rules. Now, the judgment that falls here is going to come about through a man called Jeroboam. His name will be used over and over and over in the history of the kings of Israel as the one who set out the pathway of idolatry and took the people away from God. Be clear, um, you know, it's being spelt out for us there in, in those verses that we read in 1 Kings 11 and verse 11 and down to, to verse 13, that it's um, God who spells out judgment and it's God who raises then an immediate source of trouble in Hadad. Now, the Lord raised up a, an adversary against Solomon. The further one, as I mentioned in verse 23, um, that, that man Rezon, and then this man that we're going to be thinking about here tonight, um, Jeroboam. It's God. It comes from God. Um, his name will receive many, many mentions in the Old Testament. Now, I don't have time to go through a long, long list of those this evening. But if you've got a concordance at home or something, you would uh, be able just to, to delve into the name of Jeroboam. You look at it. And you'll see that his name gets mentioned again and again and again. I'm going to give you just one example. I've just taken it well, it's random, but it's in the time of Omri. It's in 1 Kings um, chapter 16, verse 25. Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him, for he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Now, you'll find that or something very similar to that over and over and over again. This man was a wicked man and it led on to the wickedness of many others. That's a lesson. That's a lesson. Because, um, you know, even for the Christian, our compromises will become the compromises of the next generation. It led on to the wickedness of many others. You might wonder, um, seeing that is the case, how could God then, if this man was such a bad man, if his evil was so prolific and the effect that he had on the succeeding generation so bad, how could God use him for judgment? And again, this is a difficult truth, but God does. God does. It's something we've drawn attention to before. Um, it, it brings home to us that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And we may struggle with this truth, but God does. And so God, in history, will use the Chaldeans. Um, we'll uh, see him use the Babylonians. He'll use the Assyrians and so on and so forth. And he uses them at different times to bring trouble on his own people. And, and you see that truth. That's just a small part of the list. But you see that truth again and again and again. You've got that text in um, the book of Isaiah and in chapter 10, verse uh, 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread down the mire of the streets, like the mire of the streets. Um, yet he does not uh, mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off a few nations. For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calmo like Carmishish? Is not Hamath like Arphad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my, found, as my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excelled, uh, those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her I idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Now, the picture is of God using um, Assyria. They're fully involved. This is their mindset. But God is using them. 
Jeroboam was going to be used. He's going to be used. And be clear, it's willing. It's a, it's a, it's a willing thing. We, we, we read in uh, chapter 11 of 1 Kings and at verse 29, Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonites, met with him on the way, and he clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. And Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore him twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give ten tribes to you. So the man is told, you know, where he's going. He's already uh, roused in his rebellion, but he's told, he's warned. That's very strong in itself. He's warned. Um, verse 37, so I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart desires and you shall be king over Israel. God is going to bring this situation about. It's, it's mind bending, I know, I understand that. But that's the amazing story of God's sovereignty, isn't it? You know, it's something, God's sovereignty is something that ought to make us ooh, just quiet and down. Um, because God's purposes superintend and ultimately drive every event in history. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. Um, and at the end of the day, the whole world is in God's care. It's all in his hand. And we'll see this outworked um, in time. Chapter 12, verse 15 of 1 Kings. So the king did not listen to the people. For the turn of events was from the Lord. This is Rehoboam now that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And all this is going to be outworked in accordance with God's word plan, um, promise, if you like. Um, it doesn't make what Jeroboam is doing right. It doesn't make wrong right. What Jeroboam does is wrong, and he'll be answering for that on the day of judgment. But God is able to, and he does use even men's wrong for his own ultimate glory and ends. Pretty, pretty fearful truth, that. The judgment that falls, the pride that rules. But how does it happen? And notice that the counsel that prevails here. There's, there's something in this story um, that we could recognize as um, wise, because there's wise counsel here. So Rehoboam sets out to reign, and then he's presented with this uh, trouble from Jeroboam immediately. That wasn't his fault, to be fair, at that stage. But he's presented with this difficulty, and he's confronted with Jeroboam and the people of Israel, the, the tribes and so on, and they're demanding that he give them an easier time. Notice that the king does a wise thing to begin with, and he asks for time. That's a good move. Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. And we read verse 6, King Rehoboam consulted uh, the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. And um, what a wise thing he uh, at least sets out to do. There are a number of verses in Proverbs that speak of the, the wisdom. Remember, it's Solomon who wrote Proverbs, who speak of the, the wisdom. Um, and so, uh, of consulting. And so, Proverbs 11, verse 14, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitudes of counselors, there is safety. Um, Chapter 15, verse 22, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. There's wisdom, isn't there, in listening, listening to um, people, consulting, thinking, pondering, going beyond yourself. Chapter 24, verse 6, for by wise counsel, you wage your own war. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. It's a sensible thing to consult with others. Indeed, it's, it's really a necessary thing, isn't it? You'd be daft to set out on a course without taking advice first. Now, to be fair to Rehoboam, he does take advice. And from his father's trusted advisers. 
The tragedy is that when he hears it, he won't take it. And instead, he, he goes, without getting into too much detail here, he goes to the younger generation, uh, the people who had grown up with him. Then the young men, verse 10, who had grown up with him, spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you uh, make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist, and so on. And, and uh, they're saying to him, Well, don't, don't, don't give an, uh, 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 an inch. Make life harder for them. And come down and, and uh, you know, be tough. Well, you do need to take counsel, but you need to be wise in thinking about who you're taking counsel from. And you could almost wonder if Rehoboam is gathering to himself, he's rejected that older generation, those who were there with his father, and he's rejecting what they're saying, and he's listening to the, to the, young, um, to the young ones. And um, you could wonder, as he turned to them, with the thought that they're going to give him the answer that he wants. You see that in life, don't you? The question is asked in such a way that it produces the answer. Um, you may re remember um, an episode of uh, Prime Minister, or yeah, yes, Prime Minister, or yes, Minister, and um, you may remember that, that question of the survey. I, I can't remember where it comes, but how you ask the question produces the answer that you want. Well, the answer here is going to be strident. Um, and it's going to be an answer that will bring much trouble. We live in a day of people being strident. It's uh, commonplace. It's into the church and people are strident. And there's a, um, a willingness to, to, to push, to push. And it's a disaster. It's a disaster. It really is. And oftentimes you find um, people expressing opinions, uh, bold opinions now, and they don't know what they're talking about. And they've, no, they've made no effort really to find out the facts. That, that's a tragedy. Do you remember the words of Psalm 73? They're very, very comforting. You, you ponder these words. They're very comforting in our day. We read, this is the, the, the words, of course, of, um, these are the words of Asaph. Um, and he's struggling. Remember the Psalm 73? He's struggling uh, with the opposition of um, uh, ungodly men. He tells us this. He says, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no pangs in their death. Um, their strength is firm. Uh, pride serves as their necklace, verse 6. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They scoff and speak wickedly. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. And their tongue walks through the earth verse 9 wow wow you can get that you can even get that in the church and there can be a strident sort of attitude a strident attitude strong voices that push forward and prevail and it can be thought that to prevail um, you know signals that something is right to prevail doesn't signal that something is right um, wrong prevailed in the Garden of Eden, and it was not right. Ponder this verse. It's in Philippians chapter 4. We read, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. It's part of a, um, a series of uh, injunctions, things that Paul is saying there, um, imperatives, if you like. Um, let your gentleness... I think the authorised version it is that has let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Think that verse through. In other words, um, don't be trigger happy. Um, you know, think twice. Think carefully. Let your moderation be known to all men. 
And then this caution, the Lord is at hand. Oh, that that truth um, were to sink deep um, into the life of the church. The commenter, he puts it like this. He says, Rebel in the son of the wisest of men did not inherit his father's wisdom. It's easy to talk about wisdom and people can talk about being wise. I said before, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if your plans don't involve the fear of the Lord, please do not use that word wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom. Well, the judgment that falls, the pride that rules, the counsel that prevails, but the division that follows. There's judgment, there's pride, there's counsel here, but note how bitter, bitter rather, the division that follows. And you can see the strength um, of language in verse 16. Now, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king saying, what share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse to your tents. O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. Very strong language here. It really is quite sad when we think of all that had come to them through David and Solomon. The many, many blessings. Um, and so, you know, in David's time, um, there were wonderful, wonderful victories. In Solomon's time, people got to sit under their own vine. Remember that description? I think we noted that last week. Remember the... Uh, visitation of the Queen of Sheba. She, she saw all the, 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 the good things that came through um, the wisdom that God had given Solomon. And uh, she says this, imagine, verse 6 of chapter 10, 1 Kings. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words till I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Wow, what an accolade, hey? What an accolade. Yet it's all written off here in a moment. Solomon had been such a blessing to them, but it's all um, written off in a moment. Look at their language. What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Now to your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. And, um, you know, David, he had his faults. Solomon had his faults, no question. But they're written off in a moment. All the blessing that had come. And, and the truth doesn't seem to matter here. It was a worrying thing, isn't it, if the truth doesn't matter and if things are being decided, but the truth doesn't matter. I've seen that. The truth doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't seem to matter here. You know, if, if what you're talking about is going against the truth, press the red button and stop. Because if you're defying the truth, then in some way or other you're defying God who is on for truth. And you, you, you see there what the, the Queen of Sheba uh, said. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel because the Lord has loved Israel forever. There is made you king to do justice and righteousness. And we, we picked up that word last week. Justice and righteousness. Solomon had made their yoke heavy, they said, but he hadn't. Verse 4, your father made our yoke heavy. That wasn't the case at all. They were so blessed, so blessed. Their words are bitter, their words are harsh, and their, their, their words are unfounded. The commenter, he puts it like this. He says, I know nothing in Solomon's administration that could make the people's yoke grievous. I know nothing in Solomon's administration that could make the people's yoke grievous. Um, you know, what a... Difficult situation that is, where these are barefaced lies, let's face it. 
This is just a twisting of truth. These are barefaced lies. I think it's almost uh, you know, nothing more difficult to deal with. These were barefaced lies amongst the professing people of God. Time and again, you find the psalmists and they're coping with that situation where lies are being told. And the answer time and again is that we, we just have to rest content with God, leave it with God, who ultimately will bring these things to judgment on the judgment day. Notice that it's not too long before the man who is at the center of all this. Now, we didn't read the latter part, uh, just in case time um, eluded me from verse 25 of chapter 12 and to the end. We didn't read that latter part, but you could read that. And, and there we read um, that the man slips. Things go wrong. He's panicking in case the northern tribes go back. Um, you know, it's, it's all to do with his pride. It's all to do with um, his self and so on. And he's panicking. You read it for yourself. Lest that the tribes go back. And so he sets up um, idolatry here, there and everywhere. And um, he's very much involved in these things. And we read then verse 33. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month in the month. Which he devised in his own heart and ordained a feast for the children of Israel. And offered sacrifice on the altar and burnt incense. And that's what the man then is remembered for. He caused them to turn to idolatry and to make offerings here, there and everywhere and to forget God. That's what this man did. And he would have no accolade. That's for sure. That's for sure. This man would be remembered for his wrong and for the example of wrong that he set. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. How difficult to be truly wise. Solomon was given great, great wisdom. But his wives got to him. How much we need God. What a tragic judgment fell. Because of the way that he succumbed to the, to the counsel, to the, I don't know, to the beckonings of his wives and so on and he brought tragedy and there's Rehoboam his son and he doesn't seem to have the wisdom of his father and then the the malice and the bitterness of Jeroboam what a wicked man brings home to us how much we need God let us pray father thank you that you send us mercies that are new every morning we don't deserve any of them Keep us in the place, we pray, of really, truly, honestly needing you. Not the words, but the heart that needs you. Our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.